It's great to be with you today as we celebrate our church's nine year anniversary. Now, statistics show that 80% of churches don't last five years, but all praise and glory to God for the miracle that is Acts 433 Church. Because from our inception, we started with no money. We had very few people. And every single church planting book that I read, and I read a lot of them, told us that we wouldn't make it five years. But here we stand nine years later, still bringing the gospel to you. And Acts 433 Church remains as the place to find grace. Now, this, I have to tell you that this wasn't, we're not still around because of our master planning. I can tell you that. Because nine plus years ago, I never imagined that the Lord would bless us with having primarily an online audience. But I can testify that when you follow the Lord's leading, what a surprising and what a delightful place he will lead you to. Sure, we went through some valleys and we still do. But I have confidence in our journey ahead because of who goes with us and leads us is our Good Shepherd. So as I was reflecting back on the past nine years, all the memories, all the times that we laughed together, that we played together, that we prayed together, and ultimately by faith that we inherited the blessed promises that God has made us in His Word, I started to think about the plans he has in our future, and I got so excited. I am excited, and I hope that we can be together on this journey for many more years to come. Now, as we conclude the Gems from Proverbs series today, let's turn our focus to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22, which will highlight the healing power of joy and how our shared journey of laughter and faith has been a testament to the truth of this verse. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Norman Cousins was given just a few months to live in 1964. He had this rare disease of the connective tissues. I'll put the name of this disease on the screen because I don't know how to pronounce it. He was told by his doctor that he had one in 500 chance of survival. For our mathematicians out there, 0.2% chance of living. Basically, he was told that you better get your affairs in order. Now, what Norman did would be uh, very unusual today, but it was unheard of at his time. First thing he did is he fired his doctor and he left the hospital to check into a hotel. He ascertained that the culture of defeat and over-medication in the hospital was not going to be good for his health. He found a doctor who would work with him as a team member as opposed to insisting on being in charge. Number two, he began to get injections of massive doses of vitamin C. Number three, he obtained a movie projector, which was no small feat in those days, and he got a pile of funny movies including the Marx Brothers and Candid Camera shows. He spent a great deal of time watching these films and just laughing. And he didn't just laugh. In spite of being in a lot of constant pain, he made it a point of laughing until his stomach hurt from it. Well, did it work? That's the question we all want to know. Norman lived until November 30th, 1990. Research indicates that after exposure to humor, there is a general increase in activity within the immune system, including an increase in the number and activity level of natural killer cells that attack viral infected cells and some types of cancer and tumor cells. An increase in activated T cells, we know that the, there are many T cells that are waiting activ activation, and it's laughter that tells the immune system to turn it up a notch. An increase in the antibody IgA fights upper respiratory tract infections. An increase in gamma interferon tells various comp components of the immune system to turn on. And then an increase in IgB produced in the greatest quantity in body, as well as an increase in complement three, which helps the antibodies in our bodies to pierce the dysfunctional or infected cells. And so there was an increase when he watched these funny movies. 
And there was also, not just when he watched the movies, there was a lingering effect that continued to show increased levels the very next day. And all of this is just from laughter. Imagine what happens in our body when we rejoice and when we believe and we have a confident expectation of the good that God is bringing into our lives. So let's break down what Solomon is saying in Proverbs 17, 22. He says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Cheerful, it means in the Hebrew, joyful, merry, rejoicing heart. And what he's saying is it is good medicine. Now that word in the Hebrew is important, good medicine. Good medicine is geha, and geha is cure. That's what it means. So what, what Solomon is writing here is he says that a joyful, a rejoicing heart is the cure. It's not the kind of medicine where the side effects include nausea, irritable bowel syndrome, liver and kidney problems, sleep difficulties, increased blood pressure, muscle pains, blurred vision, dizziness, and sometimes death. You've probably seen a lot of commercials that they go through it really fast. A rejoicing heart is a cure, but a crushed, a broken, afflicted, or wounded spirit dries up the bones. So in our time in God's Word, what I love about it is that you will find the cure for whatever has come upon you and against you. God's Word will lead to a rejoicing, cheerful spirit, which is the cure that you need. So I'm excited to bring the Word of God to you today because the Word of God is life. It is health and it is healing to you. When we participate in the sacred ritual of communion, it's crucial to understand that the Lord sacrificed himself on the cross to remove our sins and to cleanse us, and that by his wounds we find healing. That's Isaiah 53, 5. When we don't discern the Lord's body that it was given for our health, we are actually submitting ourselves to the law of death that is already released in this world. And how do I know that? Because that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 through 30 tell us. Romans 8, 2 declares, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. God doesn't desire for us to be bound by the law of sin and death. And so to counter counteract this, we simply need to partake in the Lord's Supper with a reverence for his sacrifice, acknowledging and understanding what he accomplished for us at the cross. The Bible teaches that many suffer weakness, sickness, and premature death because they fail to grasp the life-giving significance of recognizing Jesus' sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 through 30. So the question that we need to ask is this, how can we receive this life-giving grace? Taking communion when one is ill should not be viewed as a mere ritual or formula. No, such an approach, what it does is it lacks effectiveness because in the realm of God's kingdom, everything operates through faith. As Romans 10, 17 tells us, faith is cultivated through hearing and understanding the Word of God. Therefore, the most effective way for us to partake in the Lord's Supper is to immerse ourselves in what the Word of God reveals about it. And this practice, that will fill us with faith even before we partake in the communion. It will enhance the experience and its benefits. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 22. My son, attend unto my words. Incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from before thine eyes. Keep them in the minds of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Life and health to all their flesh. You see, the very life that God breathed into us in the beginning is now within the scriptures. And so when you spend time in the word of God, it brings life and health 
not just to our physical body, but to our entire being, including our spirit and our soul. So spending time in the word brings joy from within and peace that will lead us. God's word will bring us to a place of rejoicing, which provides the cure over our ailments. That's what Proverbs 17, 22 is telling us. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. When you spend time in the word of God, you will experience number one, going out with joy, a joy within that is beyond the normal joys of life and your emotions. You see, joy and happiness are completely different things. Happiness depends on what happens to you. Joy is independent. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And so I can be going through trials and temptations and still have great joy. We see it with Paul and Silas in jail as they began to rejoice and sing uh, hymns and songs uh, to God. And in the middle of that, their chains were broken. And so they had joy in the jail. And so we can, be, go, we can go out with joy, a joy that's beyond our emotions. We don't have to be hooked up to a TV like Norman was playing comedies all the time. God's word will bring us joy, so much joy that we go out in our lives in joy no matter what happens. So number one, going out with joy. But number two, to be let out with peace, a peace deep down that leads you in your decision making. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. You are a blessing everywhere you go when you are filled with the word of God. That's the next verse, Isaiah 55, 13. You see, when you receive God's word, expect to go out with joy and expect to be led forth with peace. One of the things that's happened quite often in my life and in other people's lives that I've had the, the privilege of counseling or, or just giving a, some, uh, some wisdom, some godly wisdom to, is, uh, is when we have decisions to make and we feel a little bit uh, uh, overwhelmed by the choices that lie ahead. And, and I always use that as a marker. Ha have I gotten into God's Word? Has the word of God brought forth joy into my life? Because if it has, I will be led forth with peace. And, and that's wonderful because I'm putting things into proper perspective. That I have the good shepherd who goes with me, who leads me and guides me. He will open up the door that he wants me to walk through. And so I do not need to be uh, dismayed or distraught by the overwhelming things I'm going through. Get into God's word. Allow it to fill me with joy and lead me forth in peace. Now, one of the incredible things about God's word is the amount of joy and peace that you receive is in direct correlation to the measure of attention that you give to God's word. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30, Matthew 13, 8. And so I wanna know, what causes us to receive a hundredfold harvest in our life from God's word? Because that's what I want. Don't you want that too? I don't want a 30 uh, fold return and that's awesome. I'd rather have a hundred. A hundred is a lot more. So Mark chapter four, verse 23 through 25 says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. You'll see I underlined that part, very key. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So number one, what you hear. Mark emphasizes the importance of what you hear, as it is God's incorruptible seed, his word. That is what produces fruit in our lives. So what are you listening to most of the time? Are you flooding your mind and your heart with the news or with stuff you see on social media? Or are you taking time spent in God's word? What are you hearing? Because obviously when I hear the news, 
I am going to not be led forth in joy and peace. I'm not saying don't watch the news, but don't let that be the thing that permeates in your mind. Get in God's word so you're led forth in joy and peace. Be careful, therefore, how you hear. For whoever has, to him will be given, and whoever doesn't have, from him will be taken away, even that which he thinks he has. So we now have how you hear. Luke emphasis the, the part there that I underlined, how you hear. How you hear the word of God. The Bible says that to whoever has a hearing heart or an attitude of wanting to hear God's word, more will be given to them. As for those who do not have this hearing heart, uh, even what they already have will be taken away. So how you hear is tied into Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 12. This is the meaning of the par parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and he takes away the word from their hearts. So they may not believe and be saved. You see, the devil wants to take away the word. And there is a variety of ways that he does this. Now, to begin with, are you hearing and receiving the gospel of grace? The gospel of grace, you say, what is that, Pastor Matt? The gospel of grace proclaims the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It emphasizes God's love, his mercy, grace, and forgiveness. When we hear and receive the message, this message, the gospel of grace, with faith, we experience spiritual growth, transformation, and abundance of God's blessings. Now, on the other hand, hearing preaching that focus, is focused solely on the law, which is the ministry of death, brings to us a sense of condemnation, guilt, and in inadequacy. The law is not the cure. It crushes the spirit. It dries up the bones. The law highlights our shortcomings. The law will highlight our inability to meet God's standards on our own. Consequently, if we heed this message without understanding its context within the greater message of grace, it can lead to spiritual stagnation, fear, and even spiritual death. Therefore, Jesus, is a, uh, Jesus tells us to take heed how you hear. He's applying directly to our approach both the gospel of grace and the preaching that is centered on the law. So 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Jesus urges us in Luke 8, 18 to listen attentively, discerningly, and receptively, recognizing the transformative power of the gospel of grace and its ability to bring life, freedom, and abundant blessings to those who believe. So we had number one, what you hear. Number two, how you hear. And that leads us to number three. The same measure you use. You'll see that in like Mark 4, 24. The measure of attention you give to the word is the same measure of harvest you will reap. So if you give a 30-fold attention and focus to the word, you'll get back a 30-fold benefit, revelation and harvest from the word in return. It's not, and it's not that God's will for you is to only receive a 30-fold harvest. Your harvest depends on your attitude towards the word. The enemy knows his influence and power in your life will be broken because the word of God is greater than he is. So as, as you give your full attention to the word of God, you'll receive a full harvest and abundant fruitfulness. And I just wanted to point out that a lot of times our minds go right to uh, monetary blessings, to uh, physical blessings. But some of the greatest blessings I've received in my life are spiritual ones. I mean, you can't put a price on peace and joy and, and comfort and, and the uh, receiving the immense love that God has for you, all these things. And so I think more in line to those things, even way above monetary uh, blessings, even though those are, those are given as well. 
Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 27. So as you keep receiving God's word, it is producing fruits in your life day by day. It says, he himself does not know how, Mark 4, 27. As this man is in contact with the word through hearing and meditating on and reading and allowing it to sink into his heart and germinating on it, God is saying that this man does not even know or worry about how the seed grows. All he needs to do is to make sure that he is listening, that he has a good attitude toward the word, a hearing heart that seeks to understand what does God's word have to say to me. If he has that heart, as he is led in his day to day, God's word in his heart will naturally grow, leading to a great harvest. As we celebrate our nine year anniversary as a church, it's evident that God has been faithful to us amidst the challenges and triumphs that we faced. Our journey, which has been marked by laughter, prayer, faith in God's promises, have been a testament to his enduring grace and guidance. Just as Norman Cousins found healing through laughter in the face of a dire prognosis, we too can experience the life-giving power of joy and faith in God's word. Proverbs 17, reminds us that a cheerful heart is indeed good medicine. Whether it be the gospel of grace or the preaching of the law, whatever we listen to profoundly impacts our spiritual well-being. And so Jesus urges us to listen attentively with with our hearts open to his transformative truth. Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, who is the voice of grace. Listen to the gospel of grace only. And as we continue to sow the seeds of God's word in our lives, let us do so with eager hearts and expectant faith, knowing that God's word has promised to produce a bountiful harvest in our lives. Amen. That wonderful word spent in God's word, I hope that brought such joy and peace into your life and an expectant faith that God is going to bless you abundantly the more you get into his word because then you're really filling your your heart with his promises to you that are sure and will come to pass. So with that, let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, my desire is that this message would lead to a hundredfold harvest in the lives of the listeners. Lord, I pray that they will fill their lives more and more with the gospel of grace, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because as they do, all these blessings, every spiritual blessing is available to us in Christ. They will overflow in our lives. Lord, I know a lot of times we can get hung up on the monetary blessings and you love to bless us that way and i'm not saying that you don't but i think about the things that are so much more uh important and so much more special the things that money can't buy and i i think about every good gift i have even even the monetary blessings come from you every good gift comes from you and so i celebrate that and as i get into your word more and more i'm realizing it's not about what i bring to the table or my abilities but it's what you're calling me to it's what you're enabling me to do. It's your Holy Spirit working in my life, working in the lives of our audience, and we are seeing such an amazing uh, harvest in people's lives. I thank you that I can be a witness to that. And Lord, I pray that Acts 4.33 Church can also be a platform for others to begin to share their testimony of the wonderful things that you are doing in their lives, that their testimony might inspire and encourage others in the faith moving forward. So Lord, I pray for the boldness and the courage. If people want have, have uh, been recently blessed by you in some way that you are bringing it to their minds, I know that that's all of us that uh, they would actually post a comment in this video and share some of the good things that you have done in their lives so that we can all be encouraged to know that we are all receiving a harvest 
based upon our time spent in your word. What a blessing it is to all of us. So we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.